How did you first recognize the importance of trust in any kind of business, I would say, business or real estate? You were in the corporate environment before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did 100% commission sales for uh, air conditioning and uh, like commercial air conditioning and um, energy conservation measures. Essentially, we would partner with the local municipality and partner with the hospital or an industrial facility and offset their demand. A lot of financial justification in the sales that I did before going into real estate, even though I was using my commission checks to buy single family rentals here in Northern California. Um, but the point is, I was in my mid 20s pitching to guys where their grandchildren were the same age as me. real estate wife show and i'm your host winky lumba a commercial real estate investor and today i have a really really incredible guest my very very good friend calm mcquilly welcome calm hey how are you let's do this so one of the things that we wanted to talk about because you and i were chatting beforehand was investor sentiment in 2024 and then i i thought can we talk about the decision making process because everybody knows that a undecided or a confused investor doesn't make a decision. And so then they're stagnant. Now they're not moving forward or back. But I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. It's it really it's in line with, uh, I have an upcoming book that should be coming out maybe Q1, Q2 this year on helping create um, investor trust. It's all about trust harvesting with investors and increasing that touch in a way that is constantly adding value to the investors. But I'm, I'm just excited to, to see you. I see you at the Bay Area meetups. Um, and so we should, you should come present at ours. It's in Danville. And so, because uh, I know you have an exciting industrial project that is doing well. It's already cash flowing. And so I, it'd be great for you to share that with our attendees. Um, I'm particularly interested in industrial and storage. I have, I have I think, 17 multifamily investments, but the ones that I'm most pumped up for, for the future, are those two asset classes. Yeah, I like that. Thank you so much. So let me give you a little bit background on Column. Um, Column at age 30, after overcoming heart wall failure and a transformative TAVR procedure. Is it tower or TAVR procedure? It's, it's, it's a tower, yeah. Tower. tower I got lucky. I know. I can see yeah. that. Column shifted his focus to fulfilling work in real estate. Leaving the corporate sphere for a syndication team, he excelled as an investor relationship manager, where he honed his skill in consultative underwriting and ethical capital management. His pivotal role in scaling the investor's relationship department contributed to raising $160 million, making a significant achievement in his career. So I'm super excited to talk to you today, Colm, and our topic is going to be, like you mentioned, trust harvesting and decision making, which are the two important things, you know. First of all, trust harvesting. That's what a new term. I'm, co I'm coining That's that. That's a new term. I know because you're yeah. writing a book about it. So I really wanted to uh, hear yeah. from you. What is that concept all about? And uh, how did you come about that concept? Yeah. Uh, so just a little backtrack. Uh, and, I, and I will touch on trust harvesting. Essentially, of the 160, I personally converted 60 million of that. I, I did help create two funnels. And then I, I think I recall about 20 of of the 160 was actually institutional. So it sounds a little bit more sexy than it really is, but still it's a lot of capital. It's and lot of capital. Uh, yeah, and we and we did benefit from from the lower cost of money at the time and from uh COVID. Um we were putting on fantastic webinars, super educational. We were punching people in the face over and over and over again with value. And so when it came to the webinar raise, they were they you know they were throwing money at us and and those a lot of those deals are penciled well because of the the way that they were structured but i just want to say i was part of the team i did help create that funnel um i was the i was the bottom of the funnel in the middle of the funnel and i had access and visibility to the top of the funnel and so 
if you think about it from a syndication, if you know, if you're a capital raiser here, you have different portions of the funnel. And and so you have like your your list building, your lead gen up at the top of the funnel. You have email marketing in the middle and all these little doodads, webinars. How are you how are you capturing the leads? How are you nurturing their trust? And then at the bottom of the funnel, you typically have the conversions and then the follow-up and uh, like the in-person sales, uh, the in-person meetings at conferences or or phone calls with people like myself. So I had visibility to the top. I helped with the middle of the funnel, which was email campaigns and all these other things. And then at the bottom of the funnel, I was really nurturing that trust. I was harvesting that trust. And one of the things I mentioned to you um, last time we spoke was you you lose decision-making influence about 10% every month you don't talk to an investor. Mm -hmm. And people don't really want to be nagged over and over and over again. The, so my goal was always to figure out ways to, to collect information from investors so it could be sortable in, in batches. That way, if I find some information online, I could, and that's particular to a particular tag or contact property, I could reach out to those investors with some value. And so I'm, I'm jabbing them in the face with value over and over again to where every time I call these people, they know I'm not going to pitch them. They know it's going to be something of value. And, and that's really what trust harvesting is all about. It's how do you continuously show up and add value to these people's lives, not just when you're doing a race. So let me ask you this. I'm going to step back even further back. Let me ask you, how did you first recognize the importance of trust in any kind of business, I would say, business or real estate, you you were in the corporate environment. Before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did 100% commission sales for mm -hmm. uh, air conditioning and uh, like commercial air conditioning and um, energy conservation me measures. Essentially, we would partner with the local municipality and partner with the hospital or an industrial facility and offset their demand. A lot of financial justification in the sales that I did before going into real estate, even though I was using my commission checks to buy single family rentals here in Northern California. Um, but the point is, I was in my mid 20s pitching to guys where their grandchildren were the same age as me. So right off the bat, it was an uphill battle. And I had to figure out a way to, for one, for them to trust me, because in the construction industry, you're dealing with people that, uh, and this is, a, you know, contractors typically have the most power, but the least classical formal education. So you're dealing with egos and biases mm -hmm. and, th and these walls that you have to break down. And I was young, you know, through my 20s, I'm, I'm selling to people that are in their 50s, 60s, sometimes 70s. If I would work with like, a, like an almond or almond uh, facility manufacturing plant. Uh, let's say I was selling them a piece of equipment and, um, you know, this guy's it's his, it's his business. Mm -hmm. So I had to figure out ways to, to get past the bias that a young person doesn't know my business. And the same thing happens with, with investors. A lot of, a lot of times when these investors, they get on a sales call, they're really getting on a sales call and someone's not helping them buy. Someone's trying to sell them. And people don't like to be sold, they like to buy. So you really wanna collect as much information as you can on these investors and build a whole database around this one this one avatar or this one individual so that you can go out and, and, and connect them to information that's pertinent to them. And then we build systems in a way where we can do that at scale. Wow, that's really good. So this is like that uh, when you were talking, you know, that you, building those relationships with those um, 50 year olds and above, like not your age group, like way, way older than you. Yeah. And getting uh, sharp at that or sharpening your skills, how to break into that uh, sector or penetrate into that sector. You reminded me of this metaphor, you know, how people say selling the snow to snowmen. So it's like something like that, that you were trying to create, right? So what was that experience like overall? And what did you learn, um, the, some mm -hmm. of the skills that you learned that really, really helped you in when you step into real estate and then you were able to raise 160 million, even though you had some equity partners yeah. still there? For sure. So I think of two things. So you, you essentially said, what were some of the sales lessons you learned and what were some of the systems? 
The first thing is uh, I was drilled Sandler sales method. And that's something that I cover in my book. Well, it, you know, we were, it was titled a different method at my old, my old company, but it talks about a process and a way to compartmentalize a sales call. And I was taught in-person sales. So most of my sales were in-person and what we're doing is a lot of phone work. And so the dialogue is similar, but then it's instead of being for the construction industry or for the building operations industry, it's for an investor. So the first thing I would do is I would recommend everybody to read. You can't teach a dog or you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. So that, that covers Sandler sales process. And you could follow up with me and I can, I can, I can help you and your, your sales team on that. And then, and then the second thing is there's a book called the challenger customer. So there's a challenger sale and then there's a challenger customer. The challenger customer is about identifying different people in a, in a business that provide different types of, how do I say, you, you're going to have to find a horse to get your information from, and you're going to have to find a horse to sell to. And the whole premise of that book was you can't sell a committee. You can only sell one person on that committee. So it's important to find out who on that committee can be a peer or an ally in terms of getting information. And then who on that committee can be the person that you're really messaging your 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 pitch to and so the way that this implies to invest uh, applies to investment sales is figuring out when you're on the phone with an investor where are they getting all their information and who are the other people that they review investments with or might be part of the decision making process so a perfect example is i'm talking to a tech exec and well actually that's a, probably not a good example because uh, typically tech executives are very systematic and it's it's actually really nice working with engineers when investing because you can actually chew on their decision-making process. But let's flip over to the other side, which is physicians. A lot of money, typically physician investors are worth three times any normal accredited investor, but they don't have the financial acumen. So they rely on other people, but they don't really necessarily know how to vet their resources and their other people. And, and one example could be uh, their spouse. Right. So we want to find out where this particular investor is not only getting their information, but bouncing their ideas off of or or who's vetting the deals with them. And you can ask simple questions like, you know, uh, what is your experience in the past been with an investment like this? Oh, is there anybody else that you that you like to to, you know, bounce these investment ideas off of or or who else helps you consider an investment like this when you're when you're evaluating something like this or. You can even say past tense, you know. So the last time is like a presumptive question where you just say, "So the last time you did an investment like this, did you did your wife look at you? What is she, what, what did she think? What did she think of this investment before you move forward?" And really, what you're doing is you're seeing if the spouse or husband, if the spouse had any decision making influence or any any activities in that decision making process. But you're doing it in a presumptive way where it's not too direct of a question and it's pretty respectful versus saying, so do you need help from your spouse to make this decision? You know? <laughs> yeah, I like that. And then that transparency is very important too, right? When mm -hmm. you're going through all this experience. So when you're working with your investors, you know, in the current scenario, especially in the challenging markets that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. So how transparent are you? or um, how you're building that kind of relationship that, you know, it's again, trust relationship, mm -hmm. no like and trust kind of thing. And in that kind of relationship, you have to be fully transparent what you're doing, what it's going to look like, because every investor, they're coming in now in the present mm -hmm. stage, but they wanted to see in the future. They wanted to peek in the future to see yeah. what's going to happen. And that's going to drive their decision, right? So yeah. if we are transparent up front, like, okay, here we are, this is the present state and this is our future state. And that's how we're going to get there Yeah, without, it's, without it, any hidden agenda there. So, yeah, it's a, it's a delicate balance because essentially you got to sell the sizzle, not the steak, but also you got to help them avoid investor investing remorse or buyer's remorse with investing with you. And so by being transparent, I try to be super transparent almost to almost to a crutch I think I think I've lost investors from investing by being too transparent but I know I help them avoid avoid investor remorse 
And I can think of two examples. I, I was raising money on, on these deals where I told these guys, I saw, I told two, two different guys, they, you know, I, I understood their investing criteria. I understood what type of investments they were looking for. And I told both of these guys, two different scenarios, don't invest in this. It doesn't align with your criteria. Mm -hmm. And they still invested one because it was in Austin and the guy was super excited about Austin. And the other one was in Phoenix and it was a new development and same thing really excited about new development, really liked, uh, he really liked our billion dollar developer partner. And, and months later, they both reached out to me and said, I was right. One of them, his, his wife wouldn't let, wouldn't let him invest again until we got the first cash flow on a new development, which took, takes a couple of years. So his, his, his purse was tied because, um, you know, his whole criteria was I need cash flow up front, like your, your industrial investment right now. Mm -hmm. Um, it would have been a good fit for him. And I told him this, this is a new development. We're not going to have any cash flow until after construction. You know, the earliest we think that's going to be is probably two and a half years. And he's like, ah, I just want to do this because, you know, this market's hot. I, I think this is the only opportunity I have to get in this market. There's such a good equity multiplier. I said, this isn't what you want. So, um, but the point going back to your question is the more information you know about the investor and the more you build that relationship, the more you can tell them information, which provides transparency, builds the comfort with them and helps avoid the, um, helps avoid their investing remorse, buyer's remorse. I don't know a good name to say it besides, you know, investor buyer remorse. <laughs> Yeah, no, I like that. I mean, it's good. It's yeah. uh, I understand what you're trying to say. But let me, let me ask you this thing. You mentioned like really good thing. Uh, a couple of things, actually. You said investing criteria. And then you said mm -hmm. getting comfortable with the investor, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're in the relationship building process, when you're trying to build relationship with somebody, how do you get to that comfort level with that particular investor? That they are, that they open up with you and they share with you their maybe the personal stories, maybe their investing strategies or what they wanted to do, mm -hmm. what their goals are. Because a lot of times, what I have seen is a lot of people they get on the call, they say, "Oh, where do you want to invest? What is the target market? What kind of terms you're looking for?" That really turns off people. It's yeah. not the right way of building trust relationship with somebody. So share yeah. from your experience. Well, there, there's three things. The first thing is as a capital raiser, you don't want to seem needy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be hard because as you, as you know, I'm, I'm starting a new venture. And so we're building up our database all over again. And so, you know, I don't want to become needy. One of the things I'll do is I'll probably do a lower uh, commitment to any deal or do smaller deals up front because you don't want to be needy. You want to build your funnel up as big as possible and the bigger your funnel the less needy we're going to be, right? We don't just like, you don't want to work with me, whatever. I got 20, 2,500 other investors that are calling me every day, you know? But um, so that's the first thing is can't be needy. The second thing is, what was it? I forget what I was going to say. So let's move to the third thing. The third thing is you have to help them with the decision-making process and because they might not have clarity. And so one of the ways you could do that is, and you know, this is the, the thing that I help all my investors do. Oh, here's the second thing. There's different types of calls. So right. there's a there's a discovery call and then there's a due diligence call. Right. So that's that's the key thing I want to emphasize is in the discovery call, we're finding out about their background. Where are they at with their journey? Where they would like to be? What's their ability to contribute? What are their future plans? What's their what like what's their why behind everything? The due diligence has everything, I'm oh, sorry, the discovery has everything to do with learning as much as you can as a capital raiser and really guiding the conversation. You want to ask, maybe you want to talk 20% of the time and ask a bunch of questions and think of the conversation as a bowling ball and it's going down the lane and your questions are the bumper bars. You know where you want to go. Where you want to go is a ton of information all on this person. So you know what type of deals they like what type of opportunities, what markets, all these things, what are their tickers? You know, what are their compelling events? What are things that they've experienced in the past that are potential challenges for them to trust you? A lot of people are burned right now. Mm -hmm. So that's the discovery call. The due diligence is typically about a particular offering and product. And uh, as a good syndicator, you already have a big backlog of information on that, that unique investor 
So right. you know how to present and present that messaging in line with their buy box and mm -hmm. addressing their compelling events, addressing their pain up front. Mm -hmm. So the due diligence call is like the closed call and it's about a particular investing opportunity. And some people say, well, that's inefficient. You shouldn't need to have, you know, multiple calls. Well, I mean, studies show, even when I was at, when I was at a big group, we had a, a database, you know, six figure database. It still took 183 to 186 days from first point of contact to their investment. That's a half year of, of lead nurturing. And that was, that's one of the best, one of the biggest, best syndication companies in the country. So you have two different calls, you two, you know, or, or yeah, you have multiple calls, but two different yeah. types of calls. That's and then, true. Uh -huh. yeah. And then the last thing is the decision-making process. And, and I could actually share my screen right now. If, yeah, if it's okay. you, you can, but before um, you share your screen, I was going to ask you one question that popped in my mind when you were talking is like, uh, there's a two point call. One is an introductory call. And then there is a strategy call. Number two call. Those are important for the initial calls, but uh, I'm gonna bring this question here. Is somebody is like really raw? It's a brand new investor who never invested in real estate, right? It's a whole learning process, all educational process for that person. How do you handle those calls, and what kind of information you're sharing with them in call one and call two, and bringing up to the nurturing point, maybe through your funnel as well. You know, maybe you have six or nine or ten email sequence bringing up to a level where they feel comfortable. Okay, I'm ready to look at the deal now. Can I share my screen? Because actually the second yeah. part of this presentation addresses that. And, and what I want to share, and what I want to share is the benefits of passive investing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So I might, I might the very first call, I, it might be about the benefits of passive investing. So let me share my screen. So we got this bad boy right here. Okay, so so we're going to talk about the decision-making process. But first, you got to help these people understand why are they doing this? You only, so we talked about, uh, you know, both you and I have house cleaners, right? It's such a good leverage on our time. It's mm -hmm. all about leveraging our time. That's true. Well, with, with, uh, with real estate, it's all about leverage, mm -hmm. right? The, the, you can't call Amazon and say, hey, can I get a, a loan to buy some of your stock? They'll laugh at you, but we do it in real estate all the time. So if someone's having a very first introductory call, I would, I would help them realize that how they make their money is just as important as the income they make. And mm -hmm. so that has to do with the tax benefits mm -hmm. of, of being a passive real estate investor. And then if they're if they're a new investor, they probably don't have the knowledge of, mm -hmm. of what it takes to identify a great opportunity. And I mm -hmm. hate the word deal. That's just me personally. So I always say opportunity because not everything's a deal. And I That's think we're, so we're, mm -hmm. we're finding that out. And then another thing too is, and I learned this when I was, when I was with uh, Neil Bawa, we used to host boot camps together and, and we would talk about the rising costs of healthcare and how most people grossly underestimate their their future cost needs. You know, if you think about it, a hotel today for a weekend might cost 400 bucks. 20 years ago, that was a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. So it's probably safe to assume 20 years from now, a hotel is going to be 2000 bucks, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about healthcare costs? We're only getting older. You know, mm -hmm. it's like the, the, the day I turned 30 was the day I noticed I was putting my hand on my knee to, to bend over or to get up, you know? So <laughs> it's like, we're all getting older. And um, the, whole, the whole point is that a lot of people underestimate future costs. So it's really important to, mm -hmm. to uh, look at this, this, I don't know what this is, probably a Costco bill, but it's really important to plan for probably two, three X of what you think you need. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. and then the, it's not, it's not safe to, to depend on one source of income. COVID mm -hmm. showed us that, you know, a lot of people lost their, their jobs. Mm -hmm. And then also, Real estate is an inflation protected asset. Uh -huh. So that's another thing to, to think about. Mm -hmm. and so these are just typical things that I would, I would talk about. Uh, you get, you get, you have leverage of, of the relationships of a partnership. So mm -hmm. this person's coming into real estate new, look, uh -huh. our teams are experts with debt servicing, capital broker, asset management, property mm -hmm. management, disp uh, disposition, like the selling of it. 
and we have experience in the decision making of of how to how to basically balance out the operations of an asset. You don't have to worry about that. You have to learn how to vet the sponsor. And so, and then the return on an investment. So what I would do is this is actually a list that I came up with. Oh, this is so funny. So this is a list that I came up with of, of why you should do passive investing. And this is truthfully a screenshot of one of my tenants texting me about a toilet, right? So <laughs> the whole point is, you know, as a passive investor, you don't have to deal with you don't have to deal with the the tenants, the to the the toilets, the termites. You know, termites. Yeah, yeah, I said. <laughs> yeah. And and like this is this guy's a Facebook engineer. The mm -hmm. the rent is is I mean it's it's a great house, but um you know there's only so much you can't really there's there's like duplicate levels of scale and redundancy in in multiple unit investments, whereas in a single family investment. I'll, it's a this is you know a grade A I'll keep it, but um, it's just it's just a really nice property. But the whole point is, as a passive investor, you don't have to deal with this. Um, then here's the we talk about scale, right? Yeah. They don't have to worry about it. It's less volatile than stocks. You know, it's a tangible hard asset. You know, it's less volatile. It's funny you say that actually, or funny I say that because if you have floating rate debt, you know that that can become pretty vol volatile. But then there's an example. They said, well, why don't I just put my money in the stocks? Well, mm -hmm. do you remember when Elon democratized the little Twitter symbol and a bunch of people, a bunch of people bought the fake Twitter handles for $8 and put out fake tweets, fake tweets. And one of the companies lost $30 billion in market value because of a fake tweet. Did you hear about that? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so this is just an example of the volatility of stocks and the sheep like the sheep like nature of that. And then it's great tax play as a passive investor. Then there's liability protection. So it's like you get the benefits of everything I said above, plus there's liability protection. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, so that, that was like the top 10 reasons. So th these are the things I would go over when first talking to a newbie. Uh -huh. Like, why do you want, you know, why do you want to do this? What is the benefits? Um, mm -hmm. And then when we talk about decision-making process, I help break it down. And one of the things you mentioned is they go straight to the numbers. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you go straight to the numbers on an investment, you're skipping all these segments. Think of this as a submarine mm -hmm. and you can't move to the next gate before this whole, this whole uh, compartment's full. You know, and, and the numbers, I think, I don't even know if I have the, the, yeah, the deal numbers are here. But if you look at the way that I help my investors create a process to make a decision, it really puts them in the driver's seat. It really saves time and it helps avoid heartache and headache because every time they do an investment, this is the process they go to. And if you think about it, most people spend more time planning a vacation instead of planning their retirement. And it's just disgusting. So this is the the decision making process that I help investors go through, and if you want, maybe we could do another. We could do a full podcast where I break it down because there's actually there's actually a spreadsheet that I that I have that um, will break it down in terms of risks. So what mm -hmm. you do is you you go through these different KPIs and or these benefits or these NOIs and these different things, and you have a ranking, and that ranking is rated. It's yeah. very systematic. And that's going to help you with, with deciding whether or not this this investment's a good system for you. Uh, yeah. And I think that's that's truly the only way that you can do this without. I guess if it, so, this is a podcast, right? So yeah, it is a podcast, and we are not going to be sharing. Um, oh, actually, I do. It's a podcast. I have a video version as well. Yeah. So people who are going to plug into video, they should be able to see your presentation. But let's move on to our next question. I wanted to talk about the current market because. Um, Current market is so unpredictable, so much uncertainty. People are just like sitting on the sidelines. And now we were talking in the earlier recording that people follow the herd too. Like my friend is doing that. I wanted to do that. So what is the market sentiment that you are seeing? Or what do you see in your crystal ball, um, you know, uh, in the future for this year or next year, how it's going to roll or what it's going to look like? Yeah, so... I have been helping uh, Patrick Grimes raise for um, passive investing mastery for an income fund. And I think it's a really great position because it's, it's basically real estate backed 
debt. I mean, it, but the funny thing is I'm, I'm noticing that there's a completely different type of investor that invests in income fund versus an investor that invests in you know, the syndications we're used to. These income fund investors are very transactional. Mm -hmm. And so the, it becomes like a numbers comparing game. You know, th this group's giving you 12% and you're only giving me 10. And it's like, well, yeah, but they got a 4% fee. You know, you want me to say that I get, I'm giving you 14% and, and do a 4% fee that 14 is bigger than 12. You know, it's like these, it's a completely different type of investor that I'm experiencing this year um, with, with, in, with income funds. And I think that's become pretty hot right now. Um, and then also I'm, I'm experiencing the challenge of dealing with investors th that are burned on other investments. Yeah, I know. That's the other thing. That's how investors are just like holding back. They wanted to sit on the sidelines. Uh, we are out of time, actually. So I'm going to ask you at this point, if you can share one golden nugget with my audience, and then we'll move on to a rapid fire round. But I promise we need to have another episode and dig a little bit more deeper. Yeah, let's for sure dig deeper. I think the golden nugget is version one's better than version none. So many of us, including myself, have been uh, edutainment. You know, we keep trying to learn all these systems and we we do all these videos and these trainings, but we don't take action. And you've really got to learn by doing. That's the that's the the uh, lo the slogan from the college I graduated from, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, the Cal Poly. And uh, but <laughs> learn by doing. Version yeah. one is better than version none. The first fifty times you do anything, it's gonna not be perfect you, and nobody even okay. cares yeah nobody have, cares have, just you mm -hmm. yeah we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and i think that's the thing that both you and i specifically are, are really leaning into this year and yes. so yeah this lives this brings us to a rapid fire round and i'm gonna ask you five questions you're gonna answer in one word or one sentence only okay are you ready let's do it okay what is one of the most important thing that you have learned in your life and how did your life change after learning it? Energy. I guess a one word answer would be energy. Energy is my strength. I'm leaning into my strength. Um, a lot of people, they try to fix their weaknesses, avoid the weaknesses and focus on creating automations Positive or some energy. way. Yeah. Yes, so I like lean, that. lean into that strength and mine's energy. Okay. So uh, share with me your favorite book. I know you're writing one, so we'll cover that mm. in the next episode. Yeah, there's so many. I think the one that really changed my entire life, which, you know, it's funny, I'm going through it now. It's, it's called The Will to Change. But there's there's lots of themes in that book I don't particularly agree with, but it really helped me out. And then uh, The Body Keeps the Score is another one. And that has to do with, with uh, just some of the traumas from my heart surgery. And it's a big, big, long book. Um, but I'll, we'll, we'll say The Will to Change. Okay. But in it's, one it's, word. it's not a book. It's not a book for everybody. Um, and so I have to stress that not everything in that book I agree with, but it changed my life. Oh, okay. In one word, what does life mean to you? Opportunity. What is your biggest passion? Movement. If you could Soccer, come back yoga, to anything that has to do with just moving. Moving. I like that. If you could turn back in time and talk to your younger self, what would that be and why? In one sentence. The most important opinion is my own opinion. I like that. How can people reach out to you, Com? You can email me, com at tgaip.com. That's com at tgaip.com. Thanks, Com. I really like uh, talking to you today. It's a really good episode. And I will look forward to having another recording with you soon. Yeah, we'll we'll chop it up, and um, I think I think there's a lot of good takeaways from it, and we'll have to add on to it. All right, thanks again. I. Bye. Bye.